And Leslie Baxter, our discipline, can boast an outstanding researcher, theorist, and scholarly leader. Hers is a career that spans 35 years, and we can only look forward to what she will contribute in the future. I admire her as a role model of a scholar, thinker, mentor, mother, and friend. Please welcome Leslie A. Baxter. Don also told me I better bring it in in 35 minutes flat, so uh, I'll try and keep spontaneity at a minimum here. Thank you, Don, for that lovely introduction and this opportunity to join a very distinguished list of fellow lecturers who, since 1995, have honored the memory of Carol Arnold. Although Professor Arnold was trained as a scholar of rhetoric in the humanistic tradition, he engaged in outreach for the social scientific side of the house, including his active participation in the 1968 New Orleans conference that was, I think, ground zero for giving voice to a social scientific perspective in the discipline. I was in my freshman year of college at the time of that famous conference and thus quite oblivious to the space it created for me and many other scholars in this room to have a home in communication studies. Because my own scholarly commitments to the human sciences sit at the border between humanistic and social scientific traditions, I feel a special affinity to Professor Arnold, Professor Arnold and I'm personally honored to be speaking today in a venue that bears his name. The convention theme for this, the 95th NCA convention, Discourses of Stability and Change, underscores that multiple discourses are at the heart of meaning making. My lecture elaborates on this theme because its central claim is that everyday relating is constructed from the struggle of competing discourses that animate interpersonal communication. My remarks today rely on a forthcoming book named by Don, thank you very much, in which I articulate the second generation of a theory originally published in 1996 with Barbara Montgomery, Relational Dialectics Theory. RDT is but one of several dialectically oriented theories of relating, unique in the particulars of its appropriation of the dialogism work, dialogism work of the Russian theorist of language and culture, Mikhail Bakhtin. Barbara had the good sense or not to turn to upper administration immediately after publication of our 1996 book, but I spent the intervening years in the scholarly trenches engaged in research activity with many wonderful colleagues, including Don Braithwaite, to illuminate the discursive struggles that animate our everyday relating. Growing a theory, I have come to appreciate, is a process not unlike parenting a child. It is initially presented to the world in its formal articulation akin to a birth or adoption announcement. It requires nurturance as it takes its initial steps into the scholarly conversation. It ultimately establishes independence from the original scholars who raised it, and it continues to develop and evolve throughout its lifespan. I've been blessed to witness the use of RDT by many researchers across a range of fields, but especially interpersonal and family communication. My goal today is to share some of what we come to understand about relating, drawing largely from my own research program informed by RDT. My remarks are organized into three major parts. First, for the benefit of scholars unfamiliar with Bakhtin, I open with a very short summary of his dialogism project as I have poached it. Communication scholars unfamiliar with Bakhtin is actually a fairly large group. Uh, which has always struck me as ironic, given that Bakhtin argued from the early 1950s onward for a distinct field of study that he called speech communication to correct for what he regarded as the inattention given to speaking in Saussure's focus on language as a structural system. Second, I'm going to introduce the core Bakhtinian concept of the utterance chain. I'll use this concept as a way to organize my discussion of some types of discursive struggles that animate relating. Third, I'll address the concept of interplay, the process through which discourses struggle with and against each other to produce meaning. Let me first speak briefly about Bakhtin's theory of dialogism. Bakhtin's 50-year record of productivity from about 1920 to 1970 has been labeled dialogism by Michael Holquist because dialogue is the underlying motif in the Bakhtin project. 
Let me be clear at the outset, however, that Bakhtin's dialogue is not a stereotypical feel-good affair in which two parties bear their souls in a seamless encounter of really communicating. Instead, dialogue is a conception of talk as meaning-making that emerges from the interplay of different competing discourses. The discursive agitation of the utterance was described by Bakhtin as centripetal, centrifugal struggle. Bakhtin used the centripetal, centrifugal distinction to mark the inequality of discourses in struggle. Put simply, discourses rarely interact on a level playing field. In the context of the social world, these terms hold implications for power in that what is marginalized is easily forgotten or delegitimated relative to what is centered. The centripetal thus occupies a position of privilege relative to the centrifugal and herein rests its power. We can hear this unequal jockeying between discourses in the following passage from an online letter from Charlie and Lynn, prospective adoptive parents who are writing a dear birth mother letter to pregnant women who may be searching for an adoptive family. They wrote, after struggling with infertility and miscarriage, we have discovered that we just want a child to love. It doesn't matter how that bond comes into our life. It will be a top priority to make sure it's real and strong, built by love and faith. We know that no matter how they come to us, our children will bless us in ways that we can't begin to understand as we teach them and love them. The dominant cultural discourse of parenting that circulates in mainstream U.S. society positions adoption as a last resort when a couple can't reproduce naturally. The words of this pair have to work very hard to dethrone the dominant cultural discourse of parenting and replace it instead with an alternative discourse in which genetic bonds are supplanted with bonds of the heart. With the core concepts of dialogue and centripetal centrifugal struggle in mind, let me turn to the second of my major points, a discussion of the utterance chain. In Bakhtin's terms, an utterance is reconceptualized as an utterance chain in which words uttered in a given moment are riddled with a multitude of competing discourses, something Bakhtin described as contrapuntal to invoke a musical metaphor of contrasting or counterpoint melodies played in conjunction. I'm a gardener, not a musician, so I developed a flower-like visual image of the utterance chain. There it is in all of its glory. <laughs> I'm not very sophisticated at PowerPoint, okay? <laughs> the flower center is a given discourse, and the four petals represent various types or sites of discursive struggle that potentially craft the utterance's meaning. Two of these links, the distal already spoken and the distal not yet spoken, frame relating as an instance of cultural communication. And I will turn my attention here first by way of addressing the false binary that interpersonal communication often reinforces between the public sphere and the private sphere. In addressing the two distal links in the utterance chain, I'm emphasizing that relating is a deeply sociocultural process. Some dialogic echoes are from already spoken utterances by cultural members other than the parties of a given relationship. Contrary to the traditional view of culture as a unitary and coherent system, many contemporary theories of culture take cultural disjunctures and contradictions largely for granted. Culture is thus a fragmented, dynamic system riddled with competing voices. These distal, already spoken discourses are ever present in all that we do as social beings. RDT-informed research keeps stumbling across two broad families of discursive struggles, integration and expression, and I want to spend a bit more time on each of these. I think the salience of these struggles in their research reflects their omnipresence as key fault lines in the American cultural landscape. First, the discursive struggle of integration refers to the competition between cultural discourses of individualism and community. Robert Bella and his colleagues 30 years ago, regarded the discourse of individualism as the first language of Americans who speak in more muted ways in the second language of community. It's thus hardly surprising to hear the discursive clash of these two systems of meaning when people talk their relational identities into existence, both in conversations between them and in conversations with third parties, including interviewers. My reading of the research suggests nine different radiants of meaning in the discursive struggle of individualism and community. Time constraints prohibit me from elaborating on all of these in this venue, 
but I underscore the importance of attending to the nuances of these radiances, these radiants, for their localized variations in meaning making and the analytic detail, as we all know, always sits in the details. Let me illustrate what the struggle looks like, however, through an example of one of its radiants, the value attached to giving priority to one's own self-interest as opposed to the partner's interest. An example of this radiant of meaning comes from a study colleagues and I conducted among a population of low-income rural Iowan women in their decision-making surrounding alcohol consumption during pregnancy. These women were socialized to a cultural discourse of individualism that values individual choice in how to think and act, including a pregnant woman's decision about whether to drink alcohol. The discourse of individualism underscores self-interest, granting a pregnant woman easy justification of her choice to drink during her pregnancy because of the benefits it provides to her, for example, a release from her problems. Competing, however, with the discourse of individualism is a discourse of responsible motherhood, grounded in the broader cultural discourse of community. According to the discourse of responsible motherhood, motherhood begins with the pregnancy. With motherhood comes the moral obligation and responsibility to place the fetus's needs as primary. A mother who fails to do everything possible to protect her unborn baby from risks, for example, fetal alcohol syndrome, is being selfish and irresponsible, according to this discourse. These two discourses can be heard in the talk of a 35-year-old woman who spoke to us initially about, quote, finishing off a 12-pack or a 16-pack during a single sitting in her early pregnancy as a way to escape the stresses of life. As her utterance continued to unfold, she dethroned the discourse of individualism and shifted to the discourse of responsible motherhood. With the drinking, there's smaller birth weights and slower development. I was very terrified of what I had already done. It was my worst fear. I felt like such a bad person. I think it's very selfish. You know, I don't think you're thinking of the baby inside of you and what it could be doing to them and what's going on. If you're going to be a mother, you've got to put the baby first at all costs, she told us. This woman placed these discourses into play through a temporal sequencing in which self-interest captured her past construction of motherhood, whereas other interests, particularly those of her baby, reflects her present construction of what it means to be a mother. The second discursive struggle that keeps popping up in the research is that of expression. Parties grapple with competing discourses that inform the meaning of their expressive and non-expressive acts. I begin my comments on this discursive struggle by reminding us of Clifford Garrett's classic distinction between a twitch and a wink. Behaviorally, these appear the same, but at the level of meaning, they are wildly different. I'll move through this one swiftly. <laughs> While the wink is a meaningful communicative gesture of a conspiratorial nature, a twitch is meaningful merely as an involuntary, involuntary movement. Similarly, the discursive struggle of expression is about the meanings we construct for being open or being closed, not the behaviors of openness and closedness per se. When a communicator refrains from or enacts expression, the meaning of this act can vary. My review of existing RDT-informed research suggests that five different cultural discourses can be implicated in various combinations of interplay in rendering expression and non-expression meaningful. These discourses provide different framings for our interpretations of what it means to express or refrain from expressing. In this venue, I cannot elaborate on how each of, these discursive each of these discourses renders intelligible acts of expression or non-expression, but let me illustrate the broader point by drawing from the study of communication and drinking among pregnant women that I just discussed. One woman told us that although she doesn't think it's, appro that she doesn't think it's appropriate for a pregnant woman to drink, but she would never say anything to a woman. In fact, she told us, it's none of my business unless they ask. This woman's utterance is sensical to us through the discursive lens of individualism. It's the pregnant woman's right to do whatever she pleases, and one is obligated to respect the choices of others by refraining from comment. A different meaning was constructed of non-expression by another woman in the same study whose comments are sensical to us through a discourse of community. She said, nobody's actually going right up to that pregnant woman and saying, you know, that's not good for you. I don't think people really care not to go up and help them out. This woman is making an evaluative judgment about silence as an act of uncaring 
something we understand within the discourse of community. These two meanings of non-expression are quite different, although at the behavioral level, they're manifested the same way, silence. Of course, these alternative meanings for non-expression are in competition. In a given instance, should a woman speak up when she sees a pregnant woman drinking, thus caring, or should she keep quiet, thus being respectful of the woman's right to make her own decisions? A multitude of culturally inflected discourses swirl in talk, but I hope I've given you a feel for what discursive struggle is about at this first metaphorical pedal of the utterance chain. Let me turn to the next second pedal, the distal not yet spoken. The distal not yet spoken pedal involves the anticipation of normative evaluations that could be provided by possible future listeners who are not physically present when an utterance is voiced, what Bakhtin referred to as the super addressee. Speakers anticipate the evaluations of the super addressee and adapt their utterances so as to garner responsive approval in the moment. Any outgoing presidential administration knows well the importance of the court of history and relational parties attend as well to their own anticipated interpersonal courts of future judgment. At this pedal of the utterance chain, discursive struggles usually emerge as struggles between diverse understandings of the conventional and the ideal. These competing understandings are culturally inflected and thus the distal not yet spoken pedal is a second site of cultural communication. Discursive struggles surrounding the real family nicely exemplify research that is centered in this link of the utterance chain. Despite demographic trends away from the nuclear family household consisting of a married couple plus their biological children, the discourse of the nuclear family still captivates mainstream U.S. society as the idealization of the real family. This idealization of the real family creates obvious discursive struggles in family forms that depart from those, these idealized characteristics. For example, GBLT families, commuting marriages, or couples that are voluntarily child-free. For example, in much of my work with Don Braithwaite on step family communication, we can hear the discourse of the real family as a basis for criticism and delegitimation of and disappointment with the step family by its members. Consider this utterance by a 21-year-old young man who was discussing his relationship with his stepfather, a presence in his life since he was five years old. In the prior utterance, the interviewer had asked this participant to reflect on the most positive aspects of communication with his stepfather, and in part, this is what he told us. I would say the fact that he has a respect for me as a son, not just a stepson, but at the same time, any time I felt like he was taking too active a role, it was almost like I put a limit on what I wanted to hear from him. Okay, you told me this, that's enough, I'm not going to take any more. So I think that varies a lot from a real family where, you know, you listen to your dad because that's your dad. The stepfather is appreciated because he doesn't treat his stepson as just a stepson. Instead, he's treated as a real son. At the same time, however, the young man tells of resisting too active a role from his stepfather because he wasn't his real dad. The young man and presumably his stepfather are caught between the discourse of the real family and an alternative discourse in which family is legitimated through bonds of affection and respect. Our relating is always infiltrated with a myriad of anticipated judgments by outside others in our social worlds but in the interest of time, let me transition from the first two links of the utterance chain, both of which highlight the interpenetration of relating with societal level cultural discourses to the two links relevant to what Julia Wood has called the relational culture, that is the microculture created and sustained between the members of the relationship, whether a dyad or a family. The discourses at these two sites tend to be more idiosyncratic between the relating parties. In the proximal already spoken, I focus on the discourses of relationship identity, how the parties construct an answer to the question, who are we? In the proximal not yet spoken, I turn to discourses of self-identity, how the parties jointly construct discursive answers to the question, who am I, for each party? I'll turn first to the proximal already spoken metaphorical petal of the utterance flower. Beginning with their second utterance, interacting parties have a history. When the relational past brushes up against the relational present, we have the proximal already spoken. Relating parties ongoingly face the discursive incumbency of their relational identity 
carried over from prior utterances and encounters together, but negotiate in the moment whether and in what ways that relational identity will be reproduced or overturned. Several studies in the RDT tradition have examined important life events in which a loss of some kind has been experienced by relating parties. This loss is constructed as a profound struggle in relational meanings between the old relational identity and the new relational identity. Let me illustrate this point by talking about a study colleagues and I conducted on the marriages of older women whose husbands were residing in care facilities because of adult dementia, especially Alzheimer's disease. These wives told us that they longed for the presence of their real husbands, the husbands of their memory, prior to the onset of the dementia. This old relational identity was a powerful one for these women, and they reported despondency, sadness, and frustration because of their new relationship status in married widowhood. Evocative of the experiences of these married widows is this statement by one of our participants. He's, he's, not, he's not my husband anymore. When you have Alzheimer's, he's just not the same person. Married for 55 years, obviously I love him, but there's no closeness because he just isn't the same person. I try to remember interesting things to tell him and talk with him about, but you see, he doesn't know I'm his wife. I've illustrated this site of the utterance chain by emphasizing points of major upheaval and change in relationships, losses of one kind or another. But the discursive struggle of past and present relational identities is an ongoing motif in everyday relating as well. However, with my eye on the ever-present clock, let me turn to the last element of the utterance chain, the proximal not yet spoken. In interaction, relating parties co-construct their individual identities from the dance of their similarities and difference. Contrary to the impression left by the self-disclosure literature that the self is a hermetically sealed entity that is merely shared or hidden from other, a dialogic perspective regards the construction of self-identities as a joint enterprise. The other, who is addressed and who answers in communication, is both similar to, yet different from, the speaker. Who I am and who you are is thus constructed out of the discursive threads of our sameness and our difference. But when parties enact their relationship, the distinction between similarity and difference can be fuzzy at best. A given feature, for example, can be both at once. For example, my daughter and I are similar in our commitment to a daily exercise regimen, but we're radically different in that she likes to exercise through swimming, and my Kendall and I are addictive to the elliptical machine. Although it's easy in mainstream U.S. society to position similarity as the good cop and difference as the bad cop, colleagues and I have found that relating partners often construct a much more complex set of meanings for their similarities and differences. Let me illustrate a bit of this complexity by discussing the discursive construction of difference as both necessary and dangerous. In a study in which relationship parties talked about their similarities and differences, we heard over and over again participant reflections about how important difference was for individual growth. As one person expressed it, your strengths are my weaknesses and my strengths are your weaknesses, so we kind of accent each other in a way that we have a lot to learn from each other. At the same time, however, difference was complicated for our participants, accompanied by dangers, especially the possibilities of conflict and communication difficulty more generally. Parties talked about their differences in ways that recognized their value in the content of their talk. At the same time, how they talked about their differences functioned to regulate and contain them. Consider this example between two close female friends who were talking about the ways they were different. A and B, B said. And I also think like the way we act around guys, we act somewhat different. Yeah, um, no, yeah, we like, I'm like, I don't know. You following this? Okay, for example, I can't think of the example. How like, you know, I kind of wait to see what happens. Yeah, you're more like reactive. Yeah, and you have a little bit more like, well, I'll just ask him out or something. These friends minimize their difference using qualifiers somewhat different and a little bit more. 
They also minimize their difference by using equivocations. For example, in describing her different approach to dating, one friend said, I'll just ask him out or something. Similarly equivocal, one friend maintained ambiguity by simply failing to state an example of their difference. For example, I can't think of an example. Contrast these minimizations and efforts, I think, to contain and regulate difference with their discussion of their similarities. Why, it doesn't even sound like the same pair. B said, so yeah, we agree on a lot of things, like our attitudes about other people, about like, you know, the way we judge the same way, yeah. We finish each other's sentences, laugh, laugh a lot. When discussing their similarities, these friends repeatedly used the comparative term a lot, while they used a little bit to describe their differences. Also, their discussion of similarities was much less ambiguous. They gave two examples, pop, pop, of similarity with ease, without the seemingly impossible challenge of coming up with specifics with respect to their differences. However brief, I've now concluded our grand tour of the utterance chain, but what I haven't addressed yet is the process of struggle, and this is the third issue to which I turn next. As I discussed earlier, Bakhtin referred to this interplay of discourses as a centripetal, centrifugal struggle. I will anchor my remarks to a continuum of dialogic interplay, which captures the extent to which utterances are dialogically expansive or dialogically contracted. That is, the extent to which utterances are animated by a single discursive voice or multiple interpenetrating voices. Let's start on the left end point of the continuum and work our way to the right. Monologue. Bakhtin's, Bakhtin's suspicion toward monologue is addressed in his discussions of single voice discourse, that is, the dominance of a single perspective or worldview. Monologue is an authoritative discourse so dominant that other competing discourses are silenced. It's fused with tradition and authority that gives it taken for granted status. It functions to subvert, obscure, and deny alternative discourses. An example of monologue comes from a study colleagues and I conducted on the step family remarriage ceremony from the perspective of stepchildren. The bottom line of the study is that stepchildren often talked of the ceremony as hollow. Our analysis suggested that this emptiness was rooted in its monologic quality, in which one discourse of marriage silenced alternative discourses. The monologue of this ceremony is nicely captured in this quotation from a 19-year-old young man whose father had remarried three years prior to the interview. Being there at the wedding and watching my dad get married, and it was, well, the only part that upset me was that the pastor was talking about how life's events lead you up to this moment and how there's bumps in the road and blah, 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 but this is where you're supposed to be. And I got pissed because I was like, was my mom the bump in the road? The discourse of romance that dominated this ceremony legitimated only the dyadic bond between the marrying couple, ignoring the husband's prior embeddedness in the family constructed in his prior marriage. This other family, symbolized through the mother, was reduced to a bump in the road of life, thereby delegitimized and arguably erased. Monologue, or single voice discourse, anchors the dialogic continuum. Everything to the right of this monologic anchor involves to some extent the interplay of at least two discourses, what I call dialogic expansion. In dialogic expansion, competing discourses come into contact. They enter into a semantic bond, like intersecting lines, in which the meaning of each is somehow impacted. The systems of meaning do not exist side by side without intersecting. That's the no, the parallel lines. With this litmus test of interpenetration in mind, let's move to the vast middle of the continuum, where I suspect much of interpersonal communication often resides. The vast middle between the endpoints of monologue and transformational dialogue is a polemic place of ongoing discursive strife in which discourses jockey with one another in the business of making meaning in the moment. Let me quickly address two different places on this continuum for they capture two very different processes of discursive struggle. The first of these, which I call diachronic separation, refers to communicative practices which over time are characterized by a shift with respect to which discourse is centered and which discourse is marginalized. A feel for the ebb and flow quality of diachronic separation 
can be found in a study on the meanings of the divorce decree for ex-spouses that several colleagues and I conducted. The divorce decree as guide framed the divorce decree as an informal rubric whose spirit with respect to child visitation and financial obligations was to be followed with flexibility depending on the immediate circumstances facing family members. By contrast, the divorce decree as legal document framed the decree as a binding document whose stipulations surrounding child visitation and financial obligations were to be followed absolutely. Many divorced pairs move back and forth between these two systems of meaning of the divorce decree depending on what was happening. For example, one informant exhibited a great deal of patience with her ex-husband who traveled a lot and changed their child care arrangements quite often and with little warning by her account. When her husband, when her frustration built up, she invoked what she called the use it or lose it rule from the divorce decree to bring him back in line, in her words. She would then become more flexible again when he kept his changes to a more reasonable level. What we learned is that over time, many ex-partners apparently cycled back and forth between these two meanings of the divorce decree and that nicely illustrates diachronic separation. But common to the practices of dialogic separation is a temporal separation of competing discourses rather than their interpenetration in a given moment. Thus, if we use the litmus test of interplay I discussed earlier, diachronic separation is arguably more limited in its potential for dialogic expansion than is synchronic interplay, to which I turn next. In contrast to the diachronic process of separation are a number of synchronic processes which by definition implicate the co-occurrence of multiple discourses at a given point in time. Synchronic interplay features many discursive variations and most of the quoted examples I've given today have been examples of synchronic interplay. But these variations, I think, can be captured with reference to three underlying dimensions. First, some polemic struggle is direct in which the discourses are in each other's faces, so to speak, whereas other struggles are indirect with discourses competing through what Bakhtin artfully referred to as verbal sideward glances at one another. Second, some struggles are serious in tone, whereas others have a much more playful quality. Direct and serious struggles strike me as fairly straightforward for my purposes today, but let me illustrate both indirectness and playfulness with a short example that illustrates the power of parody to ridicule a centripetal system of meaning. Imagine someone who privileges the discourse of romance enacting a critical parody of a pragmatic discourse of love. Our speaker might say in a tone indicating that it is to be understood as parody, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Your car, your job, your income, your vacation days, your home, your retirement package. Clearly this quotation was uh, garnered prior to the immediate economic recession. <laughs> if executed successfully, the hearer will understand the deep ridicule directed at the rational pragmatic approach to love. Clearly parody is an indirect communicative act of playfulness that functions to unseat the discourse of rationality that often surrounds practical love. Third, some struggles are antagonistic in which each party's identity is aligned with a given discourse. This is interpersonal conflict as we no commonly know it. Other struggles are non-antagonistic in which all of the competing discourses are legitimated by a given speaker. For example, consider this non-antagonistic utterance by a focus group participant on the subject of dating. I guess you could say we're dating. I like him and everything and we see each other pretty often, but we're not really dating. I see other people too. The but of this utterance marks a struggle between two different meanings of dating. The first clause makes sense within a discourse of romanticism. The parties are attracted to each other and see each other frequently. The second clause makes sense within a discourse of individualism. The dating person doesn't want to be committed and their participant accounts of their vow renewal ceremony were transformational in that the competition between these discourses was erased in a discursive seamlessness. For example, the seamlessness of marriage as a private relationship between two and a public relationship interdependent with others is nicely illustrated in this description of her renewal vow ceremony by a wife of 25 years. We didn't focus just on us. We wanted to honor our families. So our pastor had Frank's mom stand and gave tribute to her. They gave tribute to my mom and dad who were there. We gave flowers to our families. And then we had a special song for all of our friends and family. We gave special tribute to them, to the group. 
And so it was kind of a tribute to everybody. In making the ceremony a celebration for family and friends, in addition to the 25th anniversary celebration of the couple, the pair symbolically underscored the interdependence between the marriage pair and the social convoy in which it was a part, of which it was a part. The boundary between marriage as a private relationship of two and a marriage as part of a larger social cloth was, for all practical purposes, erased. Let me briefly conclude. What is centrally at stake in communication is the matter of dialogic creativity, that is, the interplay of stability and change in identity meaning systems, both relationship identities and individual identities. The dialogic spirit is suspicious of stability in its extreme form, monologue, for that represents the calcification of meaning where creativity is foreclosed. Closer to the dialogic spirit is the celebration of dialogic expansiveness, where multiple discourses interpenetrate, pregnant with potential for emergent meanings that have not been uttered before. Dialogic creativity has an element of surprise and unpredictability and uncertainty to it, in which old discursive positions have potential to be shaken up, either by reversing the playing field with respect to which discursive position is centered, or by transforming meaning more profoundly. Although I don't believe that Carol Arnold was a scholar of Bakhtin, I think his long-standing commitment to conversation across the humanistic and social scientific sides of the academic aisle exemplified dialogic creativity at its best. And I urge us to carry that spirit forward in all of our scholarly endeavors. Thank you. This is. You are too kind. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie would be glad. This is Emma Baxter who helped present the award from Allen and Bacon. We congratulate Leslie, and, and um, she has a few minutes for a few questions. It's a big room, so you'll have to speak loudly, but be, please feel free. Why don't you stand and just give it as loud as you can. Um, are you asking me, do I know how that happens? Um, I would go. I would go to the discourses, and I would. Uh, if a discourse is true, is deeply centered, it is likely to be more calcified. It's harder for alternative discourses to get a foothold. It seems to me. And if there's going to be dialogic expansiveness, there has to be. Uh, a power playing field that's open to multiple discourses. So I guess I'd start with the question of, of interrogating the discourses with respect to which are centered and which are marginalized. I think that's, that would be where I'd start the question. That's how I'd start to answer the question you posed. Wine awaits. you will join us at the welcome reception this year we actually have we actually have booths at the welcome reception for newcomers for students um, so if you don't know a lot of people come and have a drink and join people in some conversational booths or um, feel free to come up and ask Leslie some more questions and engage and thank you very much for coming
participant accounts of their vow renewal ceremony were transformational in that the competition between these discourses was erased in a discursive seamlessness. For example, the seamlessness of marriage as a private relationship between two and a public relationship interdependent with others is nicely illustrated in this description of her renewal vow ceremony by a wife of 25 years. We didn't focus just on us. We wanted to honor our families. So our pastor had Frank's mom stand and gave tribute to her. They gave tribute to my mom and dad who were there. We gave flowers to our families. And then we had a special song for all of our friends and family. We gave special tribute to them, to the group. And so it was kind of a tribute to everybody. In making the ceremony a celebration for family and friends, in addition to the 25th anniversary celebration of the couple, the pair symbolically underscored the interdependence between the marriage pair and the social convoy in which it was a part, of which it was a part. The boundary between marriage as a private relationship of two and a marriage as part of a larger social cloth was, for all practical purposes, erased. Let me briefly conclude. What is centrally at stake in communication is the matter of dialogic creativity, that is, the interplay of stability and change in identity meaning systems, both relationship identities and individual identities. The dialogic spirit is suspicious of stability in its extreme form, monologue, for that represents the calcification of meaning where creativity is foreclosed. Closer to the dialogic spirit is the celebration of dialogic expansiveness, where multiple discourses interpenetrate, pregnant with potential for emergent meanings that have not been uttered before. Dialogic creativity has an element of surprise and unpredictability and uncertainty to it, in which old discursive positions have potential to be shaken up, either by reversing the playing field with respect to which discursive position is centered, or by transforming meaning more profoundly. Although I don't believe that Carol Arnold was a scholar of Bakhtin, I think his long-standing commitment to conversation across the humanistic and social scientific sides of the academic aisle exemplified dialogic creativity at its best. And I urge us to carry that spirit forward in all of our scholarly endeavors. Thank you.